it's it's cool to see all y'all it's pretty crazy too um and um i feel like this is worth it just to like have one of these zoom calls where we just like look at each other and sporadically talk so mission accomplished to get us all on here <clears throat> um so I think every, everybody here knows who I am. Um, and if not, my name is Mateo and um, been a part of uh, Round River for, for a number of years and was involved in the Patagonia program for a number of years. And now I'm uh, here at HQ in Salt Lake City and, and I'm the uh, Director of Strategic Development for Round River. It's, uh, it's pretty cool when you work for an organization that lets you just make up a, a job title. So that's what that is. You probably never get that one again. Um, so yeah, you you all probably know some of uh, some of the other folks on this call. Maybe you don't know everybody, but and it's hard to tell instructors from from students. But um, just want to say welcome to everybody. And um, yeah, this is uh, this is the first one of these. Um, and. Uh, so I hope that we all get something out of it. I hope, I hope we enjoy it. Um, and yeah, this is mostly just an opportunity to, to reunite, to see each other's faces, um, connect with some, some friends. Um, but then hopefully also um, for you guys to hear a little bit about what we've been up to uh, in Patagonia. Some of you uh, were there recently. Some of you, it's been many years. Um, I know some of you have been back uh, some of you haven't been back. Um, so I think it's an opportunity for you to, to, to hear, but also um, hopefully we can all daydream on this call about what the future might hold um, because we've all been uh, a part of it and we've all shared that experience. Um, so I think we have too many people to, to go around in a virtual circle, but I, was, I thought one thing that'd be cool is for everybody to just type in the chat um, your name and which program you were on. And then the like icebreaker part is um, maybe include one place in Patagonia that you distinctly remember, some place that was uh, really special for you um, or really memorable. Um, so we can all take a look at that. And then um, the way this call is going to be structured, um, I'm going to do a, a really quick like around the org. Uh, kind of thing, just give you a, a, a few details on some projects. Um, Ellie's going to give an overview of uh, student programs across the organization. Um, Shaylin, Gianna, um, Gabriel, and with a little cameo from Scott, we'll be talking about uh, student program. They have a really nice presentation that they put together. And then Fernando, um, hopefully we'll give a, an update on the uh, Pasqua River uh, pr uh, Protected Area Initiative, which is really exciting and which some of you may be familiar with or not. Um, and then after the, the uh, presentation, we'll do a Q&A and that can take any form. So if people have questions, it can be, uh, you know, as trivial or, or um, as deep of a question as you want and that'll guide um, a little bit of a discussion after. So uh, whatever you're curious about, um, feel free to, to um, type it into the chat. And then before concluding the call, we'll, we'll, there's these things called breakout rooms. Maybe you've been a part of one and, and we'll go into some breakout rooms at the end and we'll, we'll see how we structure those and that'll give other people a chance to talk and just you know shoot the shit um, and interact with each other. So that'll be that at the end. Also full disclosure that you are being recorded right now and uh and we're doing that for the folks who couldn't be here for whatever reason and um we'll make this available after so it's really cool to look out there it's weird to just be the only one talking with so many uh faces but uh yeah nobody's looking at me y'all looking at yourselves right um cool so um yeah i'll just go quickly around a uh, little state of the org um so uh Yeah, I, I refer to the period we're in as, as the great dying, just to jump right into it. Um, as conservation biologists, you know, it's, it's hard out there, but the thing that's, uh, it's really 
it's really incredible to work for an organization like Round River and, and feel that maybe you're, you're doing something that's contributing more to the solution than the problem. Um, so I take great solace in that. And, and I still think that we're an organization that's um, leading the charge and, and on the cutting edge in terms of conservation. Um, so here's just a few highlights. I can't get to all of our uh, projects, but um, um, as you guys know, we have a long history working in Canada. And uh, we right now are working on uh, the North Slope. Um, and the project there is, uh, is really cool. It's integrating uh, traditional ecological knowledge and science into these really, really cool um, mapping products. Um, and um, the goal of that is to, um, is to conserve wildlife on the North Slope for all of you. For any of you who don't know where the North Slope is, it's all the way up top. Uh, if you didn't know, Yukon had a slope up in the Arctic. And the goal there is to provide the, uh, the North Slope um, Advisory Council and the Inavaluate First Nation, um, that's the Eskimo uh, group up there with, um, with some tools to, ho we hope, uh, eventually protect that area uh, because cur currently it's unprotected. And of course, climate change up there is a really big deal. Um, in the southern part of the Yukon, um, that's another project that's sort of on, on the tail end. And that's working with um, some First Nations, which are the um, Kwanlin Dun and the, and the Karkross Tagish, so some, group, some First Nations that ca came together. Um, and that's a, a product called the Southern Lakes Indigenous Land Use Plan. And the idea with that is to provide a land plan and of course, Ron Rivers providing the technical part that will give the First Nations uh, a basis, uh, likes to stand on with uh, the Yukon government so that hopefully they can get some um, indigenous areas, indigenous protected areas created. Um, and, uh, and also have a voice in the management of the area. So that's a project that's um, sort of concluding this year if, if the science team, which who's working full steam ahead um, can get that done. Um, then there's the Wolverine project, um, which is, you may have heard about, and, and that's a project we've been doing for a long, long time. That's on its sort of tail end. If you want to read about that one, there's a, a paper out there by Kim called Wolverines in Winter. Um, and it's, so the, the next phase of that, it was looking at the impacts of backcountry recreation. And now what, what we're trying to do in, in the next phase is to take what was learned about uh, wolverine habitat and actually apply it to management of national forests um, in Idaho, specifically in Idaho, uh, Montana, and Wyoming, which is uh, where a lot of the wolverines are. And we're also hoping that it can be sort of an umbrella in terms of um, managing the, the, the uh, high alpine areas of, of the national forest uh, for conservation, um, because th that's as all of you know, an area that's especially vulnerable to, um, to climate change impacts. Um, and then the last uh, project that I'll mention is from Botswana. And it's, uh, that project has evolved uh, over the years. And now what we're trying to do there is called the Botswana Community Conservation Initiative. And it's a really ambitious plan that looks at um, wildlife, connectivity across northern Botswana, so it's, it's a large area, but also looking at land use and livelihoods. Um, so uh, trying to deal with some of the poverty um, issues, human wildlife conflict, uh, climate resilience, you know, everything that you can sort of imagine. So it's, it's really, really ambitious. Um, Dennis is hell bent on it. Um, there was just an article in Outside Magazine, I think got published yesterday, about him and, and, and that talks about um, Botswana, if anybody saw that. Um, so there's also a conservation trust fund that we're trying to set up with, um, with some partners. So it's, um, it's a pretty ambitious effort. And right now we're um, in the stages of uh, trying to set that up. Um, but of course, for now, we're all uh, just sort of standing still. Um, so it's a tough time for all of us humans, uh, but like you, maybe taking a solace in knowing that the wild things are uh, having a little respite here. Um, 
and we'll be back at it, you know, bef you know, before long. So, um, so it's hard, hard times for, for all of us. And, uh, but we're continuing to press on. Um, and we'll, now's the time when as an organization, uh, we've got to be really creative. And, um, so I think that goes for everybody and certainly for, for myself in, in my, um, in my current role. Um, so if you guys have questions about any of that, uh, feel free to type it in the chat or you can reach out to me individually. Um, but that's all I had. And then, um, I'll pass it on to Ellie and Ellie is going to, uh, present on student programs. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Shay, do you want to share your screen? Um, to man the presentation? Yep. Great. So some of you guys I know, some of you don't. I was an instructor between 2014 and 2018 in Patagonia. Um, so I worked many of those semesters, just a couple, where I was in Costa Rica. Um, so it's lovely to see all of your faces. I'm now, like Mateo, still around with Round River, but I've transitioned into a different role. So now I'm working as programs coordinator for all the student programs, uh, which has been my position since the fall. And it's been really rewarding. And I'm, I'm coming at you from Portland, Oregon. So, um, we can, yeah, so this map here is from our current promotional materials. These are all the locations where we currently have programs. So depending on when you were in Patagonia, we might have not yet had the Mongolia program or the Belize program. Some of these are new. Um, so we can go to the next slide if you want. Thanks. Cool. Um, over the years, we like the years that we had Patagonia programs running, um, which have been our most successful program by far. Um, we have the enrollment numbers uh, up here, so you can see you can see where you were. Um, in total, we've had 192 alumni come through the Patagonia program, which is uh, amazing. Uh, so that's that's pretty great. The Patagonia program has become our most successful program yet. We've had the highest number of alumni, and after um, some high program numbers in 2015, uh, we started getting record enrollment numbers and we started splitting into two different program groups. So the Patagonia program is where we pioneered the idea to have two groups running at the same time. Uh, and you can see those as those double bars. And um, we've since used that model in our Botswana program as well. We've run some double programs there as well. Um, let's stay back for one slide. Um, I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of an update on um, what's been happening with coronavirus in Round River and the student programs because I'm sure you're you're curious. Um, so in March, in the middle of March, we like all study abroad programs around the world evacuated our students who were in Patagonia and Botswana at the time. We didn't have anyone in um, Mongolia back home and uh, that evacuation was successful, although certainly sad for all of the students who had to have their field time cut short. Um, and we finished for the first time ever our uh, experiential field programs in a remote format. Um, so that's not something that I think any of us would have ever said that we would be doing, but um, I'm pretty proud of the students and the instructors for, for making that happen on, on short notice. So because of all the uncertainty with travel restrictions around the world, we have canceled our summer programs for 2020, and we're still looking into options for fall 2020 and all of the programs beyond that, and how we'll have to modify them with the fallout from uh, the pandemic and some of the travel restrictions around the world. So that's the quick uh, update for how uh, the coronavirus affected our most recent programs that were in the field. So uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to just go through some photos of all the groups because that's always fun. Um, we'll sort of just give a shout out to each of the different programs. If we manage to find a group photo that doesn't have you in it, I sincerely apologize and hope that you'll send us a better one. So this is the first program we had in fall of 2012. Um, if you can figure out how to do it and you're better at technology than I am, you can give a little thumbs up. 
if you see yourself in any of these. Um, so fall 2012 we had, next program, spring 2013. Kick in. Yeah. All right. We Some can go to the next. Some are than others. <laughs> Some groups are a little more sunburned than others. Some of these pictures were taken uh, a little bit earlier or later in the semester. Um, we got a lot of nice backpacking photos. Oh, there we are. I think that's, actually, I'm not sure what glacier that is, although I think I took that photo. Is that Orfidro? Um, is that Orfidro? Yeah. Nice. Spring 2015, I think this is Vallehermoso. Uh, fall 2015, these were our pretty big student groups that convinced us that we could maybe run a devil program. This is Cerro Castillo, another, oh no, this was Glacier Chico, right? Piramide, yeah. Piramide, nice. Okay. So now we're starting with our double groups. So our first double group, um, fall 2016, we had Team Waymul and Team Guanaco. So, welcome you guys. Second double group, we had Team Aguila and Team Condor. Nice. Fall 2017, we had Team Puma and Team Soro. I think that's Thanksgiving dinner right there. Um, spring 2018, we had Team Delphin. Fall 2018, Team Yandu. That's at Torres del Paine. Spring 2019, Team Chucao and Team Tero. Got Puerto Den and more um, Torres del Paine. Fall 2019, Team Coigüe and Team Mire. Cerro Castillo, and I'm not sure about the other one. Pasqua. Pasqua. And running out of names. <laughs> <laughs> we have a whole list of names for the future. It's like 10 names long. Um, Quarantine will do that. <laughs> uh, and then spring 2020, the semester that just wrapped, uh, was Team Mate and Team Truco. So welcome to all of you. The next thing we're going to move on to is just a little bit of an update just briefly on what research has been going on in Patagonia. And we'll try and keep this sort of broad strokes because knowing that some of you guys are coming in from longer ago than others. So um, this slide sort of summarizes a whole bunch of stuff. But basically, in 2012, when we came into Patagonia, you guys who are in some of the earlier programs probably remember spending all of your time in the Chacuco Valley, which is where this little orange symbol is. Um, but since then, we have expanded to work in a lot of different sites all over Aysen and the Magallanes region. So these little yellow dots represent some of our new field sites. And in addition to expanding our field sites, we've also expanded uh, the partnerships that we have. So we were invited into Patagonia to work with Conservación Patagonica, an NGO um, in Chacabuco, working in Chacabuco Valley. And since then, we've been working with CONAF, the National Park Service. We've been working with municipal governments of several different municipalities, including Tortel and Dio Higgins. We've started partnerships with the Ejército and the Armada, the Army and the Navy of Chile. And we've got um, partners in some of the local government ministries. Uh, so we've really expanded the, the community members that we've been working with and the scope of where we've been working. So I'll pass it off now to some of the field staff to talk about the specific research that's been going on. Awesome. So first, Gabe and Diana are going to introduce us to updates in the Chacabuco Valley and also Fiorda Bernardo. So take it away. All right. Thank you, Shay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, for 
for those that I already know, it's uh, great seeing you again. For the ones that I don't, so nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm Gabe, I've been Grand River instructor for three semesters now, and all of them in the Patagonia program. So um, I'm gonna start talking about uh, Chacabuco Valley, uh, or Parque Nacional Patagonia, how it is known today. Um, for those of you who don't know, or just don't remember, in 2004, uh, Conservación Patagónica, or CP, it was a nonprofit led by Doug and Christine Tompkins. They bought uh, the Estancia Valle Chacabuco, which was basically a gigantic sheep ranch, and started developing the area into a park. So they did that with the promise that later they would donate the park back to the Chilean people. During this time, uh, all the sheep were removed and CP uh, began the process of uh, rewilding the area, so allowing for natural populations to come back. Um, by 2018, Parque Nacional Patagonia was ready and inaugurated, and it encompassed at the time the whole Chacabuco Valley. And in April of 2019, Chris Tompkins fulfilled their promise and officially donated the park back to the Chilean government. In the process, two areas were, um, were aggregated uh, to the park boundaries, the Haney Menu Reserve to the north and the um, Tamango Reserve to the south. Uh, the management for those, all those areas has since shifted from CP to CONAF, and although CP still manages um, all the wildlife programs and still have a lot of uh, influence over decisions. So right now, uh, what we're dealing with is the park has uh, three sectors. It's divided in three sectors. Uh, one of them is Henimeni, the other Chacabuco, and then Tamango, um, all of which have their own body of managers and park rangers who work kind of like independently, but not so much. So uh, historically, Round River worked on many projects in Chacabuco, um, even before it was even a park. Uh, but now we have some ongoing projects uh, in all the three sectors of the park, mostly uh, focused on wildlife. So Dan and I will briefly go over these ongoing projects, their objectives, accomplishments, and future per perspectives. So the first one here um, is uh, the Guanaco service. Now, I believe most of students here participated um, on that. Uh, we've been doing that in Chacabuco since 2015, I believe, um, initially partnering up with CP and more recently with CONAF. Uh, this project basically consists in monitoring the population of Guanaco by performing census um, twice a year. So to do that, um, we used to survey the valley in car transects, counting every single Guanaco sighted, uh, but from spring 19 and on, we changed the methodology a little bit. Uh, we started uh, using transects on foot uh, in groups of, of two or three people. And this way we can cover the entire valley in more detail, which enables us to get more accurate estimates of the population size. On these last surveys, uh, we counted more or less uh, 1,200 individuals and the population seems to be growing. So our analysis estimate that the population should be somewhere around 3,000 individuals, um, most of which are typically found in the western side of the valley, pretty close to the administration. So looking at it optimistically, it seems they are expanding their distribution to the east along the years, which is great. It's good news. And what I have to say about this for the future is that this project is intended to continue from here. Uh, we aim to provide uh, long-term monitoring of the Chacabuco population in the valley for CONAF. So we plan on keeping on doing this for a while. So next, um, actually this is a brand new uh, research project. Um, we started it in fall 2019. Uh, and that was the uh, Carpintero Negro surveys. So Carpintero Negro in English uh, is the Magellanic Woodpecker 
uh, one of the biggest woodpeckers in the world, beautiful bird, and it's, it's really huge. And on this one, um, we worked in uh, old growth Lange forest of the Henimeni sector in Parque Nacional Patagonia. And this was a very exciting and also really fun research to do. Um, we were tasked with uh, assessing areas for um, Carpintero Negro presence and activity. And the work consisted in basically going out to these areas, uh, looking for potential Carpintero Negro nests, uh, and also keeping an eye on live sightings. So the nests are typically excavated on Lenga tree trunks. So we, used, we were um, serving the areas as a group, sweeping uh, all of its extension side by side on foot uh, while looking for wood chips on the ground and any signs of anything that would indicate nesting activity. So that was a lot of fun. Um, whenever a nest was found, uh, we would mark it so that later park rangers could, you know, just drop by and assess the nest conditions. And if they confirmed it to be an active nest, then they would install a camera trap to monitor its uh, activity. And our results were uh, quite interesting, actually. Uh, for that program, um, we spotted woodpeckers every survey day. And we also found 13 potential nests. And Guadaparques later told us that one of these nests were actually active and being used. As you can see on that photo on the middle, there was a camera trap that caught uh, one of the birds. So that was very interesting, some male. And from here, uh, we plan on uh, keeping on monitoring the Magellanic woodpecker population in Hanimani at least once a year. Uh, we didn't do it uh, this semester because we typically do it in fall semester. So hopefully we can try again uh, on the next semester. So lastly, on my part, um, I'll report a little bit on our research on the Tomango sector of the uh, Patagonia National Park. Um, the famous Tomango Hobo census. So the Hobo population in Tomango has declined dramatically in the past 15 years, as you can see on, on the graph here. Um, they went from 60 or so estimated individuals to a little over 10 in the last few years. So it's a very concerning situation. Since 2015, uh, Ron Rear has been contributing to CONAF's efforts in monitoring the population as a means to assess effectiveness of um, the measures taken to address the problem. Um, but um, in spring 19, uh, we, we changed the, uh, the survey a little bit. We restricted uh, our surveys to a few areas, which were since revisited every semester by a group of Ron River students. According to the data we collected, um, the homo population shows a growing trend and fawns and, and pregnant females are typically seen or sighted during surveys. So that's, um, that's very good news. Shows that the population has the potential to recover. But uh, on the other side, their numbers are still very low. So a little, over, a little um, below 20. That's a very low number for, for a population, especially in a place where there's a lot of risks, um, there are a lot of threats. So it's still a very concerning case. Hey, Gabe, Let's remember does, does, that- so interrupt, does, uh, does, CONAF yeah. have a, does CONAF have a theory for, for why their numbers are starting to go up? That's interesting. I still haven't heard back from them from about that. They're like, just doing the census, I guess. Shay. They, they think it's because their dog fence is working, which Rondover helped put in pretty, pretty early on before my time. Cool. All well, it takes is a dog fence. Okay. So dog fences, yeah. We know like dogs are a major problem there. Like it's so close to Cochrane and there are so many dogs in Cochrane. So that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, well, we, uh, the Homo is a national symbol for Chile and it even figures in their coat of arms. So that's, um, that's a very important research that we do, I think, especially for people in Cochrane, they appreciate it a lot. 
uh, they even participate with us every single time. So from here, we intend to keep up with the surveys, um, hoping to provide CONAF with the best information we can give them, envisioning, of course, the reestablishment of the, the population in Tamango. And yeah, let's hope the population will grow back to what it once was. Um, thank you all for listening. I'll, I'll leave you with Jen and Al would continue our research in the PNP. Uh, hi everyone, um, so I'm Diana. I've been an instructor in the past three semesters in Paragonia. And I'm gonna just finish talking about Nyandu and move to Fiore Bernardo. So the last of our current work in Paragonia National Park is our Nyandu research. This takes place at the very east end of Chacabuco Valley, the area um, on the map to the right. Uh, it's very close to the Argentinian border. And this area is super important because it has one of the two remnant populations of Nyandu in the Aizen region. Uh, when the Chacabuco Valley was turned into a park uh, and like they started to remove the ships, the population in the Nyandu population in this area suffered a start decline. And although we don't um, like we don't have extra studies then about this, uh, this might like, speculate that this has been due to sudden ship removal and the Puma changing its predation to Nyandu. So they didn't have ship to predate, so they started eating the Nyandu and the population declined. Seeing the de this decline in the Nyandu population, CP started a Nyandu breeding center to help recover this population. And this breeding center is located in the green area, more to the north in, at Posto Nyandu. And at the same time, they started um, monitoring the population to see what, what was going on. And then in 2015, Round River was invited to help with this Nyandu census. So we've been working in this area ever since. In the fall semester, because Nyandus are breeding and they're very sensitive, we don't do a full walking census of the area. We mostly work on the area in, the, in blue, in the Predio Militar, to research habitat quality and the effect of fences on Nyandu movement. But then every spring semester, we conduct a full census of the population. We pretty much cover the entire area in green by foot to count the, the Nyandu. Um, on the in this chart, you can see the results from censuses from CP from before and from Round River from 2015 on. And uh, in, in 2019, we actually expanded uh, our area of census, also walking a little bit into Chacabuco Valley because Conservación Paragonica actually started releasing the Nyandus from the breeding center. So up until now, they have already released 38 individuals uh, from the breeding center. They actually just released 14 individuals this week, I saw it on Instagram. Uh, so we've been monitoring and we've been seeing an increase in the population from 20 individuals in 2015 to most, almost 60 now, which is pretty cool. And that's probably the result of their the breeding center, the efforts of breeding and doing releasing, individ releasing individuals into the wild. So this is pretty cool. It seems like it's uh, becoming a conservation success in terms of recovering population who was, that was almost like, like at the edge of extinction, but local extinction. Uh, for the future for this research, we want to keep monitoring the Nyandu populations and also we want to increase our coverage for the Chacabuco Valley to check any, to see if the population is expanding outside of this area. Uh, keep keep uh, monitor, see if we can monitor the population inside Paradio Militar, see if the habitat is good, and also keep monitoring if the fences are a problem. A lot of our data shows that fences are actually a problem for the movement of Yandu, and since last year, uh, in fall 2019, we actually have started helping CP remove some fences that were left from the old sheep ranches in the valley. So if you go to the next slide, just a little bit of our work removing fences and we already removed almost 5k of fences which are actually like a lot of work something that CP alone like with just one or two staff wouldn't be able to do it so that's uh, pretty cool like on the ground helping for the conservation removing the fences um, so that's for our res current research in the in Parque Nacional Paragonica Parque Nacional Paragonia sorry and now I'm gonna move to update our current projects in another protected area of Chile, which is Parque Nacional Bernardo Higgins. In this park, our partner is still CONAF. CONAF manages the national parks in Chile. And as of now, our research on the parks mostly focus on Wemu, which is this pretty cute animal. The creas, you can see they are still cute. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Uh, 
So uh, five minutes now, Bernardo Higgins on the map. You can see the location if you don't remember where it was. And then we have a specific region within the Parque Nacional Bernardo Higgins, which is the region of Fiordo Bernardo. And this is a very remote location, but it holds one of the densest populations of OMO. Uh, so it's very important, very important conservation area for this species. And our main goal here is to help CONAF monitor the OMO population and detect changes in population parameters over time. We went a few times to explore the area, but really started working on standardized census routes and sectors in November 2016. And we go twice a year, visit the same area, same location, just pretty much count all WMO we see. Uh, on the graph, you can see our data. Uh, and what you see is like, although the population varies a little bit from year to year, and especially in November um, semesters, we see less WMO, and that's probably because female are giving birth. Uh, and that's what they're hiding. In, sorry, I forgot to say in white on the graph, you can see a estimate of the number of undetected individuals that we started doing. So based on individuals that we previously seen and survival rates and reproductive rates, we do an estimate every spring semester for the numbers of individuals that we didn't see. And based on that, we have an estimate that there, in the region, there's approximately seven individuals uh, and they 70 and they're, so it's a more or less stable population. And most of them are concentrated in the Pampa. Maybe some of you remember this really, really flat area. So we want to uh, keep monitoring this population to see if, like, to still, uh, so we don't have that much. So with CONAF data, we have a very long-term uh, study. It's one of the longest-term uh, studies of women in the region, but we want to keep doing uh, this for the future to detect any changes uh, over time. And also we were studying putting together a more detailed network of camera traps in the area to uh, make our estimates of the population better. Um, and just uh, as an update on people here, probably some, most of you or some of you know Felidor. He's still working with us when we go to Fiorda Bernardo. He's the one who whisper. He helps a lot in the surveys. And now when we go to Fiorda Bernardo, also sometimes we go with his son, Fabio, who's now a CONAF Guadaparque. I just go back a little bit. Super quick, I'm just, uh, well, it was just a photo, Feridor, Fabio, and then Raul also is a new water parker who's going with us. I didn't meet Orlando, but if you met Orlando, now he's working at Reserve uh, National Reserve in Poyaike. So those are the people. Good and now, good. yeah, I'm going to leave to Shay. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Sorry for the technical difficulties, too. Um, I'm Shay. I know most of you, and I'm so happy to see you all. Um, I was on starting in fall 15 with Adam, too, up until fall, this fall 19. Um, so I just wanted to introduce this one slide, and then, uh, and then I'll pass it to Scott. But speaking of Bernardo, we've been doing this photo monitoring of several different glaciers. Uh, but the best ones really are from Bernardo, and I wanted to share this incredible image here. So 2016 February, three and a half years later, Bernardo's retreated just a rough estimate about a mile and a half. So the system has changed a lot, um, and we're the only people that I know of that has data like this looking at it. So all of this stuff is shared with CONAF, and um, yeah, there's, the region is changing. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Scott, who is a former cool. instructor and colleague, and he's going to talk about some of his research and collaborations down on the ice field. Hey all, for those of you I know and anybody who was here before me. Hello, I'm Scott. I'm now working on my PhD at University of Maine. Um, and I was an instructor for a few years down in Patagonia and got out to Bernardo a lot. And on those long days when we're all looking for one old deer, I was always looking over my shoulder at the ice field and scheming in the back of my mind how I can get back um, to actually study these glaciers. As Shay just showed, and Adam has a lot of really great footage that he took with his drones and, and stuff down there. Like This is a really fast changing dynamic place for glacier ice. Um, for the size of the ice field, it's one of the biggest contributors to global sea level. Um, for its relative size and as you guys are probably aware it's really hard to get down there and study these things for logistic reasons for funding um, and just getting out to these sites so when I went to UMaine I pitched this idea that all right we already work with CONAF um, 
we got friends in Round River still that can get to these places. And I looked for different faculty and researchers who'd want to get down there with me and start projects. Um, and fortunately, I um, met with Kristen Schild. She's a new professor at the University of Maine who studies ice ocean interactions. So what's happening with these glaciers that meet the ocean? And in most parts of the world, these ones are the fastest retreating. So it's not necessarily has to do with rising global temperatures, but it has to do with um, warm ocean water that reaches these glaciers. Um, and nobody's looking at this, at least in these parts of the Southern Patagonia ice field. So the idea is how much and how fast is this ice retreating because of these warming ocean waters? And all that is important um, for future predictions of what's gonna happen to these glaciers. So we made it down there last fall in 2019. This is a small team from UMaine, that was me and Kristen. Um, then we worked with uh, Fernando, who's in here, Fenya, who was our fixer and helped us with all the field work. Uh, and then with CONAF, we had Felidor and Raul. And then some of our sponsors that got us down there and funding came from the American Alpine Club, who was a big contributor. Um, they love people working in areas like this where it's big in the climbing world, but um, it has this conservation side to it. The Geological Society of America, um, and then the Climate Change Institute is another place where I work. So yeah, we can go to the next one. I'll keep it brief. Um, just our first field season. This is a scientific figure, so it's not the prettiest to look at, but on the left, this shows some of the locations that we made it to. Uh, the yellow stars are those two kind of home bases where we work out of. A lot of you have been to the Refugio in Bernardo. Um, that's like box B there, and then box C is Tempanos. A few of us made it over there a couple times. Um, never inside, but. Um, and then we also made it to uh, Ofidro, which I think was in one of the photos. So some of the students probably made it out that way. Um, and then Kristen and I from the back of the, the Aguilaf here, the ship and Fenya, uh, Raul and Felidor, we were taking samples. We Basically, we're measuring temperature and salinity of the water at different depths, and we want to see how that's going to change over time. And how is this warm ocean water going to make it to the face of the glacier? Um, and then we're combining that with studies with the park biologist there, marine biologist Raul, who just recently started working there. And he's really interested in basically the life that's living in front of these glaciers in the ocean and how that changes from glacier to glacier and what that means. So, um, and the idea is to go back year after year. And we just got some funding to go back this fall. Who knows if that's going to happen. Um, but our ultimate goal is to leave all this equipment with Cohen Alpha and Round River so that they can, they're going out there all the time. They can monitor these glaciers multiple times a year, taking these measurements. They can leave um, time-lapse cameras up that are be recording year round. And then from you, Maine, we come down once, or, once a year probably um, and help collect this data. But we're hoping for a big collaborative effort here that can turn into a much bigger grant. And I'll leave it at that. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. Um, so still looking at the ice field, this is image here is of the Southern Patagonia ice field. And I wanted to talk briefly about the rapid biodiversity inventories that we do. So most of you probably remember trudging around uh, looking at Waymool poop and documenting that. And now we've expanded that um, and standardized it. So we collect data on amphibians, birds, also Waymool plants, and we do that all transect based. So we've now um, done over 20 different routes and covering over 400 miles on foot around the ice field, which is pretty awesome. Um, no one else collects that data. And we share all that with CONAF, as you know. And so on this map here, you can see in red the highest density of windmill poop that we found. Also thinking about the ice field, um, a couple years back, we expanded our research and efforts into Puerto Aden. So we first went there in fall 2016 on the invitation from a fishing organization of this small village of 60 people. And we've been going there since then with our last visit in um, fall and spring 19. So we went there with the idea of helping out with some research about sustainable tourism, sustainable, fisheries, sea press harvest, and we ended up doing a lot of environmental education. And so we formed some really deep, awesome connections with the community there. And we did uh, environmental ed trips like marine biology classes, beach cleanups, birding, we formed a kayak club, we took kids camping, and it's it's been a, yeah, a beautiful connection there. Um, with that, 
we started to expand into the Magallanes region as well. And so we would combined the Puerto Den trip with going farther stout, south. And we started and ended several trips in uh, Punta Arenas, which allowed us for a few semesters to get into Torres del Paine and also some epic hikes around the tip of the continent in Cabo Fraward. So Puerto Den was the base of our, <laughs> our most epic environmental ed trip that we did. And uh, with the help of Fernando and the whole team, we were able to convince the Chilean Navy actually to send a warship up from Punta Arenas to get up to Puerto Aden and take uh, kids from the, the town out to see the Pio Once Glacier. So that kind of inspired this larger theme of getting kids out to glaciers. And we ended up taking kids from Tortel and also Bio Higgins out to see nearby glaciers with some great collaborations on that and repeated that again um, on women's trips. So yeah, and some other environmental ed trips we did, we collaborated um, with a local nonprofit on bog research and taking some kids out to understand the peatlands. Uh, we started to go to Cayuqueo Glacier with kids from the Cochran Elementary School. And we've uh, done a lot of kayaking as well with some pack rafts um, that alpaca raft donated to us. So, yeah, environmental ed has been a really exciting expansion of the program and we've seen how by connecting with kids, we've really built, built up our reputation in the communities. And now more than any time in previous years, people really know Round River and they associated with us with like, oh my gosh, you took my kid to the glacier last year. Like, I love you guys. What can, like, how can we collaborate? So that's been a great expansion. Um, switching gears a little bit to talk about some other projects. Um, I wanted to mention the sphagnum research. So students from fall 2017, Emma Dempsey, Emma Sevier, and Sarah Wall set up these plots. Um, you can see that in the bottom left corner. These plots were to measure various treatments of harvest of these sphagnum peatland bogs with the idea of that we set them up and then we'll be able to measure the growth rate post harvest. Um, we have set these up on mostly the, the campo of Don Cristiana Ratia that you can see in the middle here and Doña Rosa. And we've been revisiting every semester to measure the growth rates. In general, um, the results have been very stark in that the control plots have grown and that any plot that receives some sort of harvest has not grown at all. Um, that differs a lot from what um, local landowners are being told that, you know, if you harvest sphagnum, it'll grow back in five years. That's a common, uh, common saying down there. And our research is not showing that at all. So that could have some pretty big implications in the long run of showing that it's actually not sustainable to harvest these peatlands. Um, also, some of you will be happy to hear that in 2019, a new national law went into effect in Chile and that restricted the harvest of sphagnum and puts a lot of requirements on that ultimately will, will really slow down the extraction and hopefully make it, make it actually sustainable. So some good things happening there. Um, speaking of Don Cristian and Doña Rosa, they are now homestay parents. And I know all of you um, who participate in homestays really you know, cherish this experience. So I just want to let you know that the programs are running so well and the families are thriving. Um, so we started doing this in fall 2016 with just a couple nights um, homestay with each of these families. And now we do a one week homestay. We've worked with over 10 families and last semester we sent students to six of those families. Um, they're milking cows, they're shearing sheep, they're building fences, burning stuff. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's always a dynamic experience. Um, we're still in touch with a lot of these families as hopefully some of you are. Um, so I wanted to give you a few updates. Nelson and Marisol in the top left are doing great. They were chosen by the regional government to start um, a pilot program of growing strawberries. So they have this beautiful big strawberry field. Um, Nano and Janet on the right hand side are doing great. Janet was the head of the Asociación Gremial, which is like the local ranching association. Um, so they're still, they have their sheep and their horses and building fences and love having our students to give them uh, hard work. To make fun of them. <laughs> Gavino and Norma are also doing great. They've got their campo. Gavino loves his horses and Norma's smoking a lot of cigarettes <laughs> as always. Um, some of you might know Orphalina, um, and she, she's also doing really well. She started doing more bicycle tourism uh, on her campo. So yeah, every homestay family that we have worked with is doing great. 
Um, with that, I wanted to give a few updates on each town that we work in, uh, starting with Cochrane. So Cochrane, since you knew it, uh, is growing. Um, a lot of people are building B&Bs out of their houses. Um, there's a lot of expansion of the tourism market. There's now two breweries in Cochrane, which might be news to some of you. Um, so yeah, the market's expanding and think, things seem like they're going pretty well. Um, some interesting things that happened in January 2019, there was a big fire that started um, from, I think some campesino was emptying out his ashtray and it ended up, it was these crazy days of 35 degree C weather. Um, and so there were fires on the Baker and around Coke Run for about two weeks and it shut down basically all the activities for the summer and Coke Run was really on emergency, um, pretty concerned that the whole town could burn down. It didn't obviously, and hopefully it prompted some good advancements in emergency preparedness for the town. Um, probably my favorite thing that has happened in Cochrane was to see the environmental community rise up against this mine that was proposed. So this Australian company had permits to explore um, a mine on the edge of Parque Nacional Patagonica on the edge of General Carrera Lake near Chile Chico. And the environmental community that was so active during the Patagonia scene Mine Mineras, or sorry, Patagonia scene Represas, rose up and created this campaign, Patagonia scene Mas Mineras. Um, and some Round River students were active in this at the time, hosted events, put a lot of um, community-based pressure against putting in that mine, and ultimately the permits were denied. So this was beautiful to see how this, you know, these legacies and environmental activism, activism create these communities that keep uh, protecting the area into the future. Tortel is doing well. Um, they had a lot of years of just increasing tourism to the point that it, it kind of reached a breaking point. And a lot of local people were, you know, unhappy with how many people had come and the lack of basic facilities there. So they kind of reached this maximum of tourism and then they stopped advertising it. Um, and in the meantime, this, the town is working a lot on improving its own infrastructure. So there's currently a sewage treatment plant being built, which is incredible. So the sewage won't be going into the bay anymore. So a lot of community work around building the basic infrastructure of Tortel. Um, still, at the same time, there is a lot of growth, though. Um, CONAF in Tortel is now head by uh, Raul Pereda, and he's a marine biologist. And so he's really been expanding CONAF's work to focus not just on Waymo and terrestrial landscapes, but to focus on marine and also protecting um, the Catalalixar National Reserve from extractive harvest. Um, and then also, say? yeah. Can I just give a brief update on Tortel? In the pandemic and during the COVID, like a huge cruise ship arrived in Tortel and is one of the first patients in the region. And Tortel was in quarantine for like 45 days or something. It was like one of, from where the COVID, the pandemic, the COVID spread in Aizen was from Tortel, from a cruise ship. So that's impact of tourism right there. Yeah, and just to add, add to that, um, Interestingly, so it's still a community that really holds this independent spirit and they self-isolated um, during COVID and I believe are still that way. So they, they cut down trees and block the road. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and from the people I've talked to, like Tortel is doing well, they're just protecting themselves basically. Um, last note on Tortel, in 2018, the municipality uh, partnered with Oceana and they created a marine protected reserve around the bay, which is pretty cool. So there's a lot um, of increasing marine biological research happening there. And last one here is Vio Higgins. Um, we have started many new partnerships there over the years. It's been a pretty dynamic place to work. Um, so one of our first initiatives there was partnering with the county government who is managing the, this reserve right outside of town called BNP El Mosco. And so we partnered with the park management to do their first research of Weymul to document where they are um, and some basic biodiversity surveys. So the photo on the right is going out with the park guards of the Mosco. Um, we've done some agro-tourism visits and done rapid biodiversity inventories on different campos around Lago Higgins. And most recently, we started partnering with a private landowner who wants to convert his 
current cattle ranch that he's transitioning out of cattle. He wants to convert it into a pr private protected area. So we've been partnering with him to collect basic biodiversity data um, in order to help that preparation of converting it to a park. And that's the photo on the left is the, the ranch uh, manager of that area, Marcos. Um, we also go to Vio Higgins um, for our basis of operations for research on the Pasqua, which I'm going to pass to Fernando next to talk about. We'll see if Fenya's uh, microphone works. This is always the moment of truth. Yeah, thank you, Shailene, for <laughs> all the updates. Thank you, everyone. Such a pleasure to see you, to see you all, to to hear your voice, my colleagues, my former students. I'm uh, glad to see you all. So about the Pascua, everyone can hear me? Yeah. About the Pascua, yeah. About the Pascua, since 2015, we've been working on the northeast edge of the southern Patagonia ice field which is actually the only gap, the only section of the ice field without uh, official protection. All the others are part of the national parks in Argentina, Los Glaciares, Torres del Paine in the south, and then all the rest is Bernardo Higgins. So the, the main idea behind is to give official protection of all this area that actually it's the watershed of the Rio Pascua, Lago Higgins Rio Pascua. We initially proposed to the Chilean government a proposal of a protected area was called Bien Nacional Protegido Campo de Hielo Sur, the Southern Icefield National Protected Good. Um, but it was too big for the government. It was about 400,000 hectares, which is a lot. So instead of that, we are proposing now a new protected area of 80,000 hectares on the Pascua River. So the Pascua River, it's the river, it's the largest river that remains pristine and reminds pristine all the water, I mean, reminds pristine from the beginning to the, to the ocean. Um, so, it would be really cool to to create a new protected area there. We are supporting Chilean government, we're supporting CONAF, we're supporting the communities into this conservation endeavor. And um, the idea would be to have this done for the next year. Currently, we have get some support from international NGOs. So that give us some hopes. And um, yeah, so it, this will be actually the, the beside you guys, you students, this will be the most important legacy of the organization in Chile. So I'm very happy that somehow this is working and we're moving forward to create a new protect, public protected area in Chile. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I have created a web a Instagram. It's called uh, Round River Patagonia. You may join there for the news if you if you want. I will be posting some news about the project, some progress. And that's all. So for the one who know me, I mean, probably everyone here uh, have shared with me some mates. But I've been working. I've been serving Round River since 2012. I yeah, and that's it, my part. Thank you so much all for joining the call. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Fenya. Uh, we just wanted to wrap up with just a genuine heartfelt thank you. It, I am just so thrilled to see all of your faces today and you students are really the reason why I did that, this job for so long. Um, you guys are the reason that we're in Chile. You're the reason that we can do all of these projects. You're the reason this, any of this exists. Um, the people of Patagonia rem remember you. <laughs> Semesters after you leave, they ask about you. Um, we remember you and 
yeah, just know that you're in our hearts and it's really beautiful to see this alumni community grow and just to have these long-term lifelong connections with people.